Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Johan Solid, who is the founder and chairperson of Forenigen Atomkraft Jatak, which uh, in Danish, I'm told, means nuclear power, yes, please. Uh, he's also the head of public relations and marketing at Carnival Energy DK. And, you know, for those of you um, wondering about my pronunciation in Danish, the reason I put you through that painful exercise was actually because um, one of the iconic anti-nuclear uh, movement's images, that, that smiling sun logo with Atomkraft Neetak, um, is, I think, what uh, what my friend Johan is, is uh, riffing off of. So, Johan, a warm welcome to Decouple. Thanks for making the time. Thank you so much. A pleasure joining you here, and thank you for the invitation. Been following you a long time. Actually, since I started Nuclear, this was uh, back in start of COVID 2020. We uh, launched our organization, and and of course, Decouple also launched. So, uh, been following since the start. So, it's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Amazing. So, uh, yeah, our, our mutual friend Mark Nelson said uh, that I had to have you on. We had to revisit. Um, Scandinavia. I did have an episode actually very early on with John Alberg um, of Carnival Energy Sweden, I guess. And we, uh, if people are interested in checking out that episode, it was called Sweden Sweden's Social Democratic Nuclear Climate Fix. And it was basically pointing out that not all, but most deployments of nuclear energy have occurred within the context, I guess, like large hydro projects of you know public spending, public planning, public ownership. And that kind of flies in the uh, in the face of a lot of people's Simpsons based assumptions of, you know, an evil Mr. Burns running everything. Um, so that was an interesting episode. People should check the archives for that. Um, but yes, uh, today we're looking at, um, you know, Vikings with Adams, um, looking at what, what the new developments are. And I understand there are many. Um, I think a good place to start, Johan, before we jump into the nuclear thing is, you know, you're, you're coming to us from Denmark, um, where I understand people are starting to reconsider nuclear. Um, I think it'd be interesting to explore the reasons why. And of course, we do want to uh, explore the context of Denmark as a uh, first mover on wind with, I think, the highest deployment of wind in the world. Really, really interested in understanding that context of Denmark, um, particularly in terms of how it leads into a country reconsidering nuclear. Because, you know, it was interesting. People talk a lot about, you know, the need to obviously engage with the public and, you know, convince them and and share, you know, good data points and, and whatnot. Um, you know, but I always say, you know, in the context of, say, um, the UK, where Great British Nuclear was recently launched, it wasn't that the public all of a sudden changed their mind in vast droves. Um, it was the imperatives of, of energy security uh, after the Russian invasion that I think really um, cued the Boris Johnson government into making a move on nuclear. So I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, both, you know, the communication side of things, but also in terms of what the underlying factors are um, leading to a reconsidering of nuclear uh, within Scandinavia. So. Enough of uh, of my voice, Johan. Uh, feel free to jump in there and riff off of off of anything. Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, let's start with like the organization that we that we created. So as said before, it's uh, four years old now, uh, three to four years old, and it's a hundred percent volunteer based, uh, member supported organization. So everything that we do is uh, in our free time, and we we actually do this as much as our our pay, paid job. So we are working a full time X two. Um, and what we have experienced that when we went into nuclear in, in the in the uh, in the area around COVID, it was that there was a big um, there was a big knowledge gap in between what the public thought and what the scientific consensus actually was on the uh, on this topic. And uh, if you look at the opinion polls in 2016, only six, 16 percent of the Danish population actually supported nuclear energy. And if you look at the latest population polls from Denmark, uh, opinion polls in 2000, uh, March 2023, it's 49%. And it's uh, wow. and the, 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 uh, the anti-nukes, it was like 66% of people were against nuclear power back in 2016. And today it's only 32. So it's shifted like immensely. So we are in a position today where we have a lot more uh, supporters than people against nuclear power in Denmark. And this is, I, I always say that there are three factors, three main factors in this explanation. Of course, the first one is that of, um, we have the the, uh, the climate crisis and a lot of it, climate is a, it is a very big topic in Denmark because as we are such a welfare state and we had uh, such good living standards. So in, in if you look at the martial of uh, uh, behavioral py- pyramid, you can see that we're in the top. So we actually f- use most of our time as young people to focus on climate. So there's been a, big, big, big focus on how to solve climate change. And for the last 30 years, we have 
invest a lot of money in wind, especially. And what we see today is that the numbers start start showing now that we only have 10% of our, t- our total energy demand comes from wind and solar. So this last 90% of our energy usage is still from burning stuff. So that's from biomass, coal, gas, and oil. And this combined with the cl- climate change made uh, the two two of the factors for getting nuclear more support in the Danish uh, context. And lastly, the, the the energy crisis that started in the summer of 2021, half a year before the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we saw electricity prices rocket. And then to, to icing on the cake, then Putin, he, Putin, he, he invaded Ukraine. So these three... Um, bullets they were the ones to to actually uh, to 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 remove this barrier because I, I think like in Sweden they had a law back in the 80s after the uh, Chernobyl accident the Tange Forbudslaven some vine uh, it was a, a law against thinking about nuclear you couldn't do anything nuclear and and the same thing has been in Denmark since 1985 that nuclear power has just been abandoned it cannot by law be deployed in Denmark so it's illegal and that automatically, of course, makes it, uh, uh, it's not favorable for inv- investors, universities, or the public to just think about nuclear. So, uh, but now it shifts. We have uh, different external uh, events, climate crisis. We have the Danish uh, green light being exposed. And then we have the energy crisis. And, and that makes a very good foundation for a, a nuclear debate in Denmark. For sure. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um... You know, first off, I understand, um, you know, this this uh, nuclear ban. I'm curious, were there plans to deploy nuclear in Denmark? Um, were these shelved? I mean, we have an example of Austria of a nuclear plant that was essentially finished and, and abandoned, I think, as a result of a referendum. Um, yeah, let, let's walk into that period. Um, first answering that question and then, you know, I guess response to to the OPEC crisis, the, the previous uh, crisis and, and, and how Denmark responded if they didn't use nuclear um, in the ways that, say, France did. We'll take a deep dive back in history, back to, to the end of the World War II. We had uh, our famous, most famous uh, physici- uh, nuclear physicist called Nils Spohr. He, uh, he participated in the Manhattan Project, which uh, made the Americans actually uh, muscle him in the way that he was put under some kind of NDNA, so he couldn't participate in any peaceful use of nuclear energy. And that was because Nils Bohr had this very uh, altruistic idea of nuclear technology has to be shared around the world. And of course, after the Manhattan Project, the most secret uh, project in the world, the Americans didn't want Bohr to actually give uh, uh, information, uh, confidential information to the Russians and so on, the, the Soviets. So, so the Danish nuclear program after the, the Second World War wasn't, wasn't actually a thing until the Atoms of Peace in 1953, where both uh, Norway, Sweden and Denmark started uh, doing uh, uh, reactor programs. And in Denmark, it was mostly based on research reactors. So we put on, uh, we deployed three reactors in Denmark uh, near uh, in a little city close to the capital called Roskilde. Um, and also in Norway, they deployed uh, research reactors and, and in Sweden. But uh, when this program was deployed, of course, then it was Nils Bohr's time to shine. His uh, his muzzle was uh, gone and he could speak, but he he died uh, not that many years later. So the the pace was a little bit removed from the from the project because he was like the, the guy behind nuclear inventions in Denmark. And if he said no, the politi- politicians said no. So he was like the, 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 the primus motor. And... What happened there was that nuclear back then, of course, didn't compete with uh, other green energy sources. It was climate change wasn't even a thing that we we knew of. We didn't know about global warming. James Hasn't hadn't made his confession to the to the U.S. Congress. So so uh, nuclear power was uh, to replace fossil fuels, and mainly we had used coal in Denmark. So it was a great great replacement. But, but then oil came, and oil just removed our focus from nuclear power completely because this was the cheap. Uh, some kind of abundant energy source, and then we use that. And then you said before, jumping to, to 1973 with the OPEC crisis, we see that a lot of uh, European countries is put in the situation where they have to, 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 to think of a new energy source. You have France doing it with the MESPA plants and the deployment of 56 reactors in, in 10 years or something like that. And you have Sweden also going nuclear, Switzerland, all these countries. But Denmark they are put in the situation where we don't have that much knowledge at this point because we abandoned our research program a lot uh, several years before. And 
in in the time after the OPEC crisis, the anti-nuclear movement was uh, created. And this movement, as we see, saw in America, it was created on on uh, on on the uh, on the basis of uh, anti-nuclear weapons, and it was very very strong. You got a lot of uh, popular people, musicians, artists to uh, to to be in this uh, movement, and them against the 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 not to offend anyone, but like boring uh, engineers and physicians that that had um, the experience with nuclear power that couldn't could compete. So they lost this this fight of the narrative against uh, the 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 uh, the uh, new anti nuclear movement and then that led to uh, through the 90s we actually had programs to develop nuclear power plants we were had locations we were actually going to do it uh, political support but the anti nuclear movement by themselves because we weren't uh, ready to combat them with with science and knowledge won so in 1985, we put in a parliamentary decision actually banning nuclear uh, from the Danish energy mix. And uh, since then, it was just with Chernobyl the year after, it was the last nail in the coffin. And and then it was like like in Sweden, illegal to think about. Um, and then we had the, the great idea to invent the wheel again and, and try to build windmills and burn coal for 30 more years and kill thousands of people in Denmark from air pollution. So that's the that's what we did in Denmark, the green leaders. All right. There's so much I'd, I'd love to bookmark from uh, that last summary of yours. But I'm curious, uh, in terms of the the anti-nuclear movement in Denmark and understanding that better, you mentioned these these cultural figures. In in some places, I'm thinking of Australia, I think in Long Island, New York as well, um, there was certainly an interest in the coal industry, for instance, of suppressing the nuclear industry. I think we see that in Germany as well, with some of the, uh, the German uh, coal unions um, having been integral to the anti-nuclear movement, was there anything like that in Denmark, or just the nuclear industry hadn't hadn't gotten off the ground uh, by the time of the nuclear ban in 1985? It, it was just like you had this. Uh, of course, you had this very strong, as I said before, grassroots movement of anti-nuclear, and it wasn't supported by any corporations or anything. It, it was actually just them against the the publicly owned electricity company called Ilsam at that point which were the ones that should build the nuclear plants. But the, the, the problem was that the politicians, they just they were just too late to the party and, and the scientists. So when they started and wanting to build nuclear in Denmark, the anti-movement has built too strong to, to, and, and too big and, and to have captured uh, so, much, so many people in, in Denmark. And, and they own the narrative. And that's the thing. Like if a, if a country goes nuclear, it's about who owns the narrative. And it would be nice if, if science and information and, and academia owned the narrative, but they were just too late to the party. Because, for example, Sweden, they, they actually had their first reactors online in the, in the early 70s. And that was before the anti-nuclear movement was actually a thing. We started actually wanting to build these reactors after the anti-nuclear movement was a thing. So they could follow along and do all of their fear-mongering and spread FUD and all of this, making it very hard for politicians in this space to 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 move around because they, they in Denmark it's a small country we only have right now five to six million people back then they could gather fifty thousand to a hundred thousand people and march through the country and be like we don't want nuclear power so so it was it was immense for such a small country to to do this and they got a lot of help from the Americans and the Germans to support the anti nuclear movement and and it was way harder without a, a, a person as Nils Bohr, because he passed away too early, that if he had been there and he had, could, had, had carried on the legacy, I would say that it was a possibility that we would have nuclear power in Denmark. Interesting, interesting. Well, I mean, as you were mentioning recently, the narrative is starting to slip uh, from the anti-nuclear to the pro-nuclear side. Let's, let's explore, uh, back to your initial framing, um, some more about why that is. So um, the energy crisis hits, the OPEC crisis, um, Denmark is doing a lot of their electricity production, power generation with oil. What happens? What's the fuel substitution that occurs? Mostly coal. The, the substitution uh, through the, uh, after the, the, the OPEC crisis is mostly coal. So we keep on burning coal mainly as we go back to the energy source that we used before we went to oil. And, uh, and we also accepted the high prices. So, so we actually also in Denmark in, in, the, in, the, in the oil crisis, in, every Sunday we had a car-free Sunday because we didn't want, so you could just walk on the road. My parents told me about like every Sunday you could just run on the highway and play <laughs> like with small kids. So, so that's that's we 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 shifted back to coal and opened a lot of coal power plants, and that's why we we still in Denmark has these 
big, big, big cogeneration thermal uh, power plant around the country we have tens of them, big units over 300 to 800 megawatts of electri- electrical power output. A lot of them has been now retrofitted into being a biomass furnace, most of them. Um, but uh, we can also get back to that later, why biomass is, uh, and your listeners also know that that, that is not uh, even better than coal. It's sometimes worse in, in, in case of CO2 emissions. Um, so so we, 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 after the OPEC crisis, the, the, the way Denmark went, it was like, we are going to invent the wheel, windmills, and uh, we are going to keep on burning coal. That was the way that we did it. And you had you had Sweden and France that went nuclear. And- so two questions. Where did the coal come from? Was this all imported or does Denmark have any of its own reserves? And we'll, we'll, we will get to biomass later, but just quickly, where does the biomass come from? I don't, I don't think of Denmark as being particularly you know, filled with forests, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, mostly of our fuel is imported. Uh, and if we, we talk about coal, yeah, it's mostly imported back then. Uh, as well as now, we still burn coal in Denmark. It's a part of our grid. We still have it in our grid, and our our consumption of coal actually uh, actually uh, uh, well, we're rising the last couple of years because we didn't we couldn't get the the amount of biomass that we were actually using. So in Denmark, we import most of our biomass from uh, from abroad, and over fifty percent of all biomass in Denmark use. So that is not only wood and, and pellets, but that's also like uh, waste from agriculture, and we have a big, we have a lot of agriculture in Denmark, of course. But most of it, over fifty percent of it, is uh, trees that we burn, like wood pellets. And most of this comes from the Baltics. So that's from uh, the Baltic countries, where you have a lot of protected areas, uh, Natura two thousand woods, where companies uh, clean cuts these areas and uh, make e- either they make the wood pellets in this, uh, in Baltic. The Baltic countries all they ship the, the wood directly to Denmark where we where we make the, the wood pellets ourselves. And as I said in the start, 30% of all Danish energy usage, not electricity, but energy usage, comes from biomass. So because we have a lot of district heating in Denmark, we only only have 20 uh, 20% electrified in Denmark. All of our heating comes from come from uh, district heating. And the district heating plants, that is only biomass. So our whole heating system is is uh, is uh, made up of of burning other countries' woods, and of course, because of the Kyoto Protocol from nineteen ninety seven, um, if you import biomass from another country, the the one that gets the um, the bill, the CO two emissions, is the country where you imported it from. So all of the biomass that we burn <laughs> in Denmark, n- not a single gram of CO two is put on the Danish CO two emission. So when Danish politicians, ah, we have the most uh, ambitious climate uh, goal in the world with 70% reduction uh, since 1990, it's just one one big fat green lie because we have so much biomass that if we put that into our emissions, oh my God, it would be skyrocketed. There's around 18 million tons of CO2 in, we would add on to the Danish um, emissions if we counted biomass. And without them, it's only 30, 33. So 50% increase, increase nearly if we put the biomass in. Um, so in, in an Excel arc, it's, uh, it's great. But uh, for the climate, is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a climate hazard. It's, it's just a lie. It's, it's a green lie. And just briefly, the coal, is that coming from Germany, from Russia? Where, where's the coal coming from? Mostly like we had, we had coal imports from Russia before, but of course of the sanctions, the, the, it would come from, from the closest country we also have from, yeah, from Germany, for, for example. But, but most, we don't import that much from Germany because of most of their export is, is of course lignite. We try, to, we try to burn cleaner coal in Denmark. We try to be less of an evil, but, uh, <laughs> but we don't use that much anymore. Uh, we have around 6 to 10% of our electricity production comes from coal, I, uh, I would say. But... Um, but mostly from from Russia before, and also Australia and, and other big coal exporters. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's let's shift to talking about uh, reinventing the wheel, as you put it. Um, as I was mentioning, I think Denmark's a real first mover. Uh, Vestas, very renowned, um, you know, wind turbine company uh, based out of there. Uh, a lot of government subsidies and supports. Um, so t- tell us a little bit about. We had an episode recently with Angelica Wong on on the offshore wind industry and some of the challenges they're facing with scaling right now and supply chain localization. Uh, but I'm I'm very curious to to if we can deep dive this a little bit, um, the history of of wind in Denmark. 
Okay, history of wind in Denmark. It started around the 70s and 80s in Denmark, where we had some uh, we had some projects with uh, something called the Zwin uh, windmill, which was the first big uh, one megawatt windmill, I think, produced electricity to the grid. And after that, the the Danish uh, Napoleon complex came into to order because we have uh, we're such a small country, but we want to have such a big impact on the world. So we see, oh my God, we have this energy source that nobody else is using let's be the the pioneers of it so we pumped in 30 years we pumped a, a free th- figure a billion like i think 300 billion danish crowns it's like 50 billion euros into actually inventing wind in denmark and in in this whole period we're still burning coal and we're still burning biomass. So in in the time that we invent trying to invent the wheel, we're still doing the same old climate uh, pollution uh, uh, at at as coal and, and and gas. But through the through the years, we also get the the great idea of of doing a offshore wind, as Angelica, as you you talk mostly with her on the the later episode. And the problem there is that wind in Denmark for the last thirty years has been subsidized. It hasn't. It, it couldn't handle the, the 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 free market, so we had to subsidize it through the electricity bills and through taxes. Now we are in a position in Denmark where we are not subsidizing anymore. That is what we are saying. But of course, we also can get into that the externalities, like the system cost, the grid cost, the curtailment cost, the profile cost of having wind in a system is still being subsidized. So we still have to pay for the transmission cables. We still have to pay for the concealment and so on and so on. So the subsidies hasn't disappeared in Denmark. They're just being, um, they're just uh, being hidden in, in, inside uh, integration costs. Um, but back to, to, to with Vesta as like the pioneer of wind and deploying wind all over the world. What we have seen now when they don't get the same kind of subsidies, we see all of the, 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 uh, all of these companies like nearly going bankrupt. We are seeing the latest numbers from these companies showing that uh, a company, all of the, the, also in the supply chain, the smaller companies that uh, sends the, the, the small different parts to Vestas to build the mills, they cannot, like it's negative. The economy is negative. They don't see any profit. They're, they're, this, non, this. they're non-profit organizations now as a joke. <laughs> yeah, they actually in, have in a Involuntarily non-profits. Involuntarily yeah. non-profit, negative capital, actually. So you have bigger investors coming in to save them right now. And all of the people in Denmark, they're saying, yeah, it's, it's, it's going only downwards. And that's because, of course, we have tried to make wind this competitive, been pushing subsidies into it for 30 years. And it's like it's like it's like when you started to ride a bike when you were a child and you never took off the wheels on the side, the baby wheels. You just kept on riding thirty years in advance, and then a day somebody told you that you cannot ride a th- three wheeler anymore. You have to take off the wheels, and then you will crash, of course, if the, nobody helps you. And that's what's happening in Denmark. We had this idea that this industry could do it by their own, but as we see now, not only by inflation and COVID and all of that, all industries is impacted by that. These companies are in red numbers, and they're not going bankrupt because I think personally that the state will will come in and 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 support them in in the end. But this will be a very big uh, what can you say um, very big problem for them, of course, because they have promised for so many years that uh, that after we have subsidized them, they will they will be uh, be, be on market terms, of course. So uh, it's a it's a big problem in in Denmark for wind companies. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of path dependency and a lot of uh, politicians and policymakers that would have to eat humble pie uh, to acknowledge this. Are those cracks starting to emerge um, in terms of public discussion within Denmark? Is it just that, you know, electricity prices are high and there's kind of a popular revolt around that that's leading people to, to reconsider wind and maybe open up to nuclear? Or yeah, I'm just wondering what the media landscape's like, for instance, right now. Is it freely talked about? Yeah, it's 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 changed a lot the last four years when we have been to, into it. When I started this, it was like, and it sounds very cruel and it sounds out of proportions, but like saying that you were pro-nuclear 10 years ago was saying like nearly that you were a pedophile. Like that is the same order of, of magnitude of the word, the semantic value of it. So, so now it's much more open and journalists are actually speaking about it in a, and, and actually uh, not quoting Greenpeace for facts, but actually going to professors and, and quoting the IPCC or the IEA, the JRC, the EU Commission and so on. So the it's more fact based now, but still a lot of journalists because most Danish journalists of of course is on the left wing, 
they have the the from from the milk of their mothers that they are anti nuclear. So there is a bias also in the media and Denmark. But it's it's getting better because in in the end you cannot run from facts and you cannot run from the science and that is what has been shown now. And uh, also with 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 the wind, it's it's a hard pill to swallow. It's it's a very hard pill to swallow from for for Danes to actually say we were wrong. We were wrong thirty years ago. We should have built nuclear power plants back then. We kept burning coal and now we have to like do something and we cannot and it's so hard for them to actually admit that they were wrong and we have to 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 think about nuclear because our organization we're not saying like we only have to have nuclear we have to have a mix of wind solar nuclear hydro norway and sweden and so on have a have a mix of all energy sources but the other camp of renewables they're just no nuclear no nuclear only wind and solar and and then we can have to rely on the other countries so so right now it's 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 starting to emerge we're on the tip it's like we are, we're on the point of a no return in denmark but it's going to be a long and it's going to be a hard way until we get nuclear and of course an energy crisis help it it makes people uh see the realities but 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 now the the hard work comes is to 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 actually get the politicians on board and we have some parties in Denmark that are pro nuclear we have uh, some of the on the right wing parties but of course right wing parties in Denmark is totally left wing compared to american or or other countries <laughs> politics uh yeah it's like it, we all one big left wing country if you look at it from outside but um the public is supporting the some politicians are joining and also the the businesses are going out now and saying that we have to we just have to th- can we think about it not we should have it but Maybe is it okay to think about it? Is I am I going to be called a pedophile? Like we we want to get out of the shell, and is it okay to think about nuclear? Yeah, right, right, right. Um, I'm also curious about I guess the academic establishment. Um, you know, we have our our Mark C. Jacobson uh, in the U.S. Uh, there's a number of you know Canadian academics I could point to um, who are sort of ideologues of of this uh, you know green vision. Um, is that something that carries weight in Denmark as well? Is that another sort of pull of power to push against? Yeah, like the the most of the academic space about energy systems in Denmark is 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 grounded in 100% renewable energy systems. So a lot of these people were were part of the anti-nuclear movement back in the 70s and 80s, and then they they transferred from uh, the 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 activist point of view back then into academia, and then they 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 like got the rubber stamp of their ideas through publishing energy system analysis only on renewable energy systems. So in Denmark we have these. Danish Mark C. Jacobson types that are actually also working with Mark C. Jacobson and publishing studies with Mark C. Jacobson. So it's it's a big part of the identity in, in academic. And that's like the academic has been captured by 100% renewable in Denmark because a lot of these people, they their mindset is 100% renewable energy system. So a priori, their thought is that nuclear is not a part of the mix. So of course, all of the analysis, system analyses will show that nuclear is not a part of it because they have already made a decision to exclude nuclear from their energy system models. So, And this is a big, not fight, but a discussion we are having in Denmark right now where an organization like ours, we are going in and uh, actually running the same models from these um, academics and changing the parameters and changing the, 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 the info that is put into the models and showing that if you actually have a, a reasonable capital cost, a reasonable capacity factor, a reasonable uh, uh, interest rate, then there is a place for nuclear in Denmark. But of course, they will say like, uh, they will use the price of Oikelutu and the build time of the Finnish reactor or the fra- uh, of Flamenville or Hinkley Point and say, this is how nuclear in Europe has been built. And this is also the price that we will have in Denmark. So nuclear is not an option. And of course, we all know that first of a kind and also nth of a kind, it has a, a lot of reduction on, on nuclear power plants. So so the Danish academia has been captured by by 100% renewables, and and that is starting to change because a lot of people from the uh, physics departments are coming out and being like, okay, what is happening? Like, they they slept for 30 years and they forgot it, and now that like you have a lot of people that engineers doing mathematics that should not be done by engineers that should be done by social scientists or uh, economists or or calculations that should be do by uh, physicists so so um it's it's starting to uh, revolve yeah well i mean let's 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 engage i guess with uh some of the mythology or the claims made by by these academics and this is just you know from my 
uh, 10,000 meter view here. Some of the things I've heard is, I mean, Denmark is a small country. Um, it is next to, you know, Europe's um, hydroelectric battery. Um, you know, yes, there's problems with intermittency, um, but Denmark has, you know, a huge shallow continental shelf around it. It can deploy lots of offshore wind cheaply. Um, and, you know, when there's lulls or droughts in wind, um, we can keep it decarbonized by just, uh, you know, again, using uh, Norway as, as a great big battery. Deconstruct that for me. The problem around, like, Denmark as of now, of course, it's it's good for Denmark to build offshore wind. But the problem is that when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, we are reliant on the countries connected to us. And that's Germany, uh, Norway, and Sweden. And we have approximately around 8 gigawatts of capacity uh, interconnectors to these countries. And our maximum use of electricity is 6 gigawatts. So we have more capacity that we can import to Denmark than we can actually use. And still in these situations that sometimes when the wind doesn't blow... And the Dunkelflaute is not only a German thing, it's also a Danish thing. And the wind speeds in Germany and in southern Sweden and southern Norway and in the Netherlands and Belgium and Denmark are correlated. So when you get these wind droughts, all countries drop in wind production. And solar in the winter, you cannot count on that. And then we are reliant on coal from Germany, we're reliant on nuclear from Sweden, and we're reliant on uh, hydro from Norway and also hydro from Sweden. And the problem is, as of now, it's barely working. We we are actually experiencing episodes in the Danish grid where we are having very close to not to to to, to follow the demand of the the usage. So we don't have enough electricity. But if you ask Norway and Sweden, do you have enough power for your industries? Do you have enough power for the next thirty years of electrification? They say we we are in a pickle. We don't know how to actually make enough power for us ourselves. And if Denmark should should actually like. Have the expectation is that now when our windows doesn't blow, like we, we just get some power from Norwegian hydro or, or Swedish uh, nuclear. It it's not realistic, and these these assumptions is what we are actually presenting to these uh, uh, these one hundred percent renewable professors and and so on, Maxi Jacobson types of people, and they don't have this in their models. They don't uh, calculate if there is the if the 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 right amount of production capacity on the other end of the. In, the um, transmission lines. They just assume if we build more transmission lines, then there will uh, magically be uh, the generation power on the other end. And that is not the real reality that we are looking into now with Norwegian having not enough rainwater in their reservoirs, Sweden going to have 70 gigawatts of in the next 20 years and actually saying we are not going to export in the next maybe 10 years because we don't have enough power for ourselves. They have a deficit of around 8 to 10 gigawatts in, in some, some years we have heard. We don't have the capacity. And then the only thing that Denmark can do in these situations, get back to coal, get back to biomass. And we saw this once, we saw it back in the 70s, and we can make this mistake again, because we have capacities installed, 10 gigawatts of thermal capacity, I think, installed in Denmark. So we can easily get our electricity and heat but from fossil fuels and biomass. And maybe history will, will repeat itself in this manner, that we go back to coal and, and biomass. Well, if, if we end up following uh, uh, Robert Bryce's Iron Law of Electricity, I think that's that's quite likely to happen. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting. There's there's a big focus on on climate-induced or you know weather catastrophes and the kind of damages they're doing, and, and much is made of that in the news. I think what's, what's ignored is uh, blackout damages, and I'm thinking here of the the Texas blackouts and freeze, which are rumored to have cost over 200 billion um, in economic damages. I mean, the the cost to the UK of the electricity crisis dwarf even what a nuclear built out of of reactors costing it at Hinkley Point would 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 uh, would cost. That also seems to not factor into uh, into the modeler's work. Um, you know, this incredible amount of economic damages and, you know, the relative low cost of even high price nuclear to to avoid that and build a more more resilient system. Um, something that caught my eye in doing a little bit of research for this episode um, was the idea of wind powered district heating. Um, it just seemed comical to me. But um, again, can you <laughs> help me understand, make the case if there's one to be made and uh, just help us understand what what exactly that is? It seems it seems a little bit illogical to me. Yeah. Okay. So in Denmark, we have some maybe the most the best connected district heating network in the world. Like we have so millions of houses and millions of Danish people being supplied by district heating from central uh, thermal uh, units. And the idea is that instead of 
so removing the furnace of a biomass plant or a coal furnace, you'll just build a big heat pump. Instead of a, like a small residential heat pump, you'll just scale it up a thousand times. And then you will use this to heat water and then send it out in the district heating network. And of course, and again, this is the reason also with Danish uh, solutions, we haven't seen this in big scale being used. Again, the same problems. What do we do when we don't have electricity to power these heat pumps? What are the, the losses of energy from, from electricity to thermal to, to water and so on? So, so we are looking into a future where Denmark is gambling with the solution. So we're just saying... Ah, we have this district heating. We also have some batteries. We had some uh, interconnections. We don't know if it works. We haven't seen 100% renewable energy systems anywhere, but grab it. Let's do it. Like it's going, it's going onto into the casino with with our climate politics, and uh, and and so and that's also why we see all of these thermal power plants not being shut down. Actually, they are. I think like they're they're on standby if it if if it all just goes to. To 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 I, I'm not going to swear on the podcast, but uh, but if it goes to hell, um, so so that's so. But but big heat pumps and is is a thing that we're pursuing in Denmark right now. And I'm just asking the same questions: What do we do when the wind doesn't blow to supply these heat pumps? What do we do in winter when we don't have solar uh, solar power? So, so and these questions they seem so basic, like. It's 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 repeated so many times. What do you do when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? But it's it's still valid. It's still so right, valid right. questions. And, you know, and it's it's obviously we've we've harped on this before that there actually is a word in the German vocabulary for these sunless, windless periods that can go on for weeks. The Dunkelflaute. But we also had a great episode with I believe Hannah Rosenblum. Uh, it was my favorite titled episode. We do put some thoughts into trying to create entertaining titles, and it was uh, what is a wind drought? Europe's lust for the gust. And of course, that was pre-Russian invasion um, when wind speeds, I believe, throughout the North Sea dropped off pretty dramatically yeah, um, yeah, exactly. and led to, to very low outputs. Um, Denmark, I presume, was affected uh, during the yeah. kind of great 10% of, of, of our generation was, was affected in that uh, period. Um, okay, one last um, uh, energy uh, surprise. Um, the energy islands or, or the renewable islands. Can you, can you just, I, I'm probably mispronouncing or, or not, not describing them by the term that's been used. Um, is that what's going to save Denmark from from blackouts and make this whole Ruberg, Rube Goldberg machine, um, you know, House of Cards balance itself out? It's it's like uh, it's like a fairy tale. It's like a Disney movie, like uh, Peter Pan and the 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 Mystery Island. Like we we're going in Denmark to build these uh, artificial islands in the middle of the sea, where we will have uh, uh, power to X units like uh, pyrolyzers and electrolyzers. Uh, doing uh, making synthetic fuels like mostly hydrogen and and, and making ammonia and, and methanol, and around these islands there will be big wind parks and they will supply these islands with electricity and then we will create uh, thin fuels and we will send some of the electricity to the grid, or and use the thin fuels to to power ships and 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 planes. The problem here is that again we haven't seen this before. It's it's totally new and it's the, the, what we have seen the last couple of months is that. A lot of documents has been released from the climate ministry showing that these projects were promised to not have any subsidies. They were promised to not being tax money from 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 the citizens of Denmark. But what we see now is like up to 10 billion euros in subsidies for every single island, nearly around five to 10 billion in subsidies for these islands. So and in Denmark, five to 10 billion is a lot. It's it's quite an, uh, a staggering amount of money. So these projects were being sold and promised to be uh, nearly free, as they call them. We have uh, companies coming here and, and and building wind for free, but now it shows that that the cost overruns, even before the project has started being built, is so immensely high that they are going now. They're saying we 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 pausing, so we have paused these uh, energy islands in Denmark for now, and now uh, we we have. T- we are now taking half a year, 10 to 12 months to rethink the whole idea of energy islands. And I made a bet with one of my friends, like a hundred, one hundred dollars. Like, I don't think it's going to happen. Like now the, the amount of capital overruns before the project has started is so staggering that this is the Danish population is not going to accept this. And this is a great opening of course for nuclear, because as you call it a Rube Goldberg machine, these energy islands, it's, it's like 
you're trying to invent, invent the wheel again and trying to make a new electricity system in the middle of the goddamn ocean. Like, it's why don't you just put energy sources on land being centralized or decentralized with SMRs, producing power close to the consumer and being cheaper in the long run and being more cost efficient and actually um, actually so, uh, doing things that we, we know work. Like we have done nuclear for 60 to 70 years. We know this works. So why should we try to invent an energy island? Like it sounds, even in Denmark, we all think it's a joke. So it's not like people from abroad like thinking about an energy island. Danish people also see this as like bogus. It's it's just fugazi, fugazi, fairy tale. An energy absurdity. I mean, it is interesting, this question of, you know, how how long can these subsidies last for? I think, you know, money, the words of former guest Nate Hagens, it's a monetary claim on biophysical reality. Um, and, you know, so much of that sort of surplus wealth um, that we we lean upon and that Europe has accumulated through a number of <laughs> historical uh, adventures, uh, colonialism, but also through, uh, you know, energy extraction, um, it, it's it's based upon um, cheap fossil fuels in my mind and, and the kind of infrastructure that's been created and the societal wealth that's been created. But, you know, at what point uh, does the ability to subsidize unviable forms of energy start to start to reach its limits. I mean, do you, do you feel like that's that's beginning to happen in terms of, I'm not asking you, you know, to give, uh, you know, I, you're not an economist, I don't think, but I, I'm just curious about this question myself. I mean, is, is is that what we're starting to see? Is that what's driving a lot of, of inflationary pressures? You know, can how, how much longer can Europe subsidize its way through a, an unviable energy transition, in your opinion? I, I studied political science, so I'll try to use my, uh, my small amount of uh, economic knowledge and macroeconomics to... to decipher this um the thing is that subsidies of course they they are doing a lot of path dependency so when you subsidize a field then you get stuck in subsidies mostly so it just keeps on going for years and years as we talked about before Uh, and when you remove the wheels of the bicycle people will fall but you reach a limit as you say you reach a limit where you have you have went so long down the wrong path that the externalities of keep on doing it is worse than changing path and we are we we're 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 heading that way right now as we're seeing with the energy islands because before it was like we have a limited amount unlimited amount of money and windmills is just going to get billions of billions of of danish kronos but now seeing the 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 parliament actually stopping projects before they begun because they're going to be too expensive show that they have put themselves in a pickle because they promised us that this shouldn't be subsidized after 2020 so so now they're saying like okay no no wind parks can be subsidized no energy islands can be subsidized and when we run the analyses and we run the calculations we see billions of dollars in subsidies needed to to make these projects and that's also why we see the the companies going nearly bankrupt because the price has been dumped so much on these energy technologies to to make a false belief of them being price competitive to other technologies that now when they have to walk on their, on, on their own, they cannot survive. So the real price of wind and solar maybe is, is, is higher, mostly in Denmark, than, than we are seeing now because this is made, made possible by subsidies mostly and a security. So the risk of a company uh, building out 10 new, uh, 10 new uh, uh, industry halls to make windmills, they could easily do that before because there's an unlimited amount of subsidies. But now they cannot do this. They cannot scale their production in the same manner, and that that shows in the in the numbers of their of their latest uh, latest reports that these these companies are, are hurting. They're they're in the red. So I mean, the European solar industry uh, cratered, I believe, in uh, the early two thousands, and and packed its bags and moved to China, where you know polysilicon production was cheaper, manufacturing costs were cheaper. Um, I understand seven of the 10 largest wind turbine manufacturers are now based in China. And uh, even with the European companies, a lot of their manufacturing, particularly of simpler components like, you know, rolling the steel for the towers is, say, in Vietnam, for instance, um, with with uh, the status of becoming involuntary nonprofit organizations. Um, is there a crisis, you know, with uh, Siemens Gamisa or Vestas and, and, you know, more production moving to China or Europe potentially um, losing its its foot in in the wind game, or or is there still enough sort of high technology within the nacelles um, that that this can still be an economic driver? Like you know, a, a big question of this and a big promise, I think, of of uh, of uh, you know the green energy movement is that you know we can have supply chain localization. That Denmark will 
um, see its, its subsidies pay off in terms of the local economic opportunity from having been a first mover in wind. Um, to what degree is, you know, how, how much does the wind industry in Denmark employ Danes? Um, to what degree is, is wealth kind of recycled within the system? Of course, when you have an industry that has gone, gone for 30 of years, you have a lot of on-site uh, national production of these, uh, a lot of the components in, in the supply chain for windmills. Of course, you have a lot of the, the more advanced technology and a smaller components that is put into the to the windmills and so on, and also in the towers and in the electricity grid that is produced inside Denmark. But this, as I say again, has been possible because there have been a, a, a unlimited money tank supporting this. And what we see in other countries as China or, or Asia in particular, that when they get the opportunity to get hand of the technology, then they will just do it even cheaper than we do. They will do it much cheaper and they'll do it much better because they don't have the same regulations as we do. And, and, and that's a bad thing, of course, because they have an environmental regulations that is not as strict as ours. Because, But putting that aside... I've, China is 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 getting into the game in the same level as Vestas with with solar with, with wind uh, turbines as well as solar panels with other manufacturers and that we're seeing with Siemens Gamesa dropping like thirty five percent in a couple of days in 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 the stock market the, their stocks just plummeted and we also see this with with, with as I said before the the smaller um, the smaller companies in the production chain the, the supply chain. They're just going bankrupt in Denmark because they cannot compete anymore because the the materials are too expensive and they come from China and China the the of course the a lot of the 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 rare earth that has to be put into to windmill magnets or just minerals in particular the, the price of those has skyrocketed so the business model of being cheap 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 and being nationalized production chain is starting to disappear and for example with solar panels in Denmark just just a brief example. One fifth of all solar panels in Denmark has their origin from the Xinjiang province in China, with slavery work and and working camps and the oppressed uh, uh, minority group of of, of uh, Turkish Muslims, I think, in in uh, in in Xinjiang province in China. One fifth of Danish solar panels are from there, and that is all. That is not going to stop now. We are still building solar parks in Denmark from. Uh, supply chains from China, from the Xinjiang province. And this is just also going to happen with wind because we cannot compete anymore in Denmark on the prices that we're seeing from Asia um, and uh, particularly China. So if the state is not going to, to, to save these companies, they'll go bankrupt and the production will move to China. And then China has a, a gridlock, a, a very firm grip on the Danish and the European green transition if we are going to be reliant on their min- min- minerals. And as we have seen the last couple of months that China is saying that we have the opportunity to, to just artificially pump the prices up. And if you invade Taiwan, we'll just close it off. So they are having a lot of leverage in geopolitics as well with having all of the, the minerals and metals being produced in China and being shipped to Europe. So maybe we built the windmills in Denmark, but we are solely dependent on Chinese minerals and, and, and other metals to, to work. And if they want, they can just pump the prices up and we'll go bankrupt. No, I mean, I'm thinking about the differences between, uh, you know, you and I uh, in terms of our, our challenges with nuclear advocacy. And I don't want to say that it's easy here in Ontario, but, you know, the, the kind of uh, path dependency here of, you know, being 60% nuclear powered, of having a highly localized supply chain because of our national reactor technology, I mean, that does have an impact on political decision making. Um, and despite a number of challenges, I think that's why we're seeing such successes here. Um, politicians simply know that a good chunk of their voters, um, their bread is buttered by nuclear. Um, and I imagine there's a, a similar dynamic in Denmark with, uh, with the wind industry and a path dependency and a political patronage um, in, in that regard. So so interesting, interesting differences there. I do want to, uh, we've been talking a lot about the, the context and talking a lot about the challenges for uh, particularly wind in Denmark, very, very useful for, for me to understand. Uh, but let's let's spend our last 15 minutes or so chatting about um, some of the exciting opportunities for nuclear in Denmark. Um, I understand there's two kind of SMR companies taking a crack at things, Copenhagen Atomics and Seaborg. What what else is new um, in, in the nuclear sector? As you, as you start out, that we have the two companies, Seaborg Technologies and Copenhagen Atomics, uh, 
trying to manufacture first generation uh, MSR reactors, molten salt reactors. Uh, Copenhagen Atomics uses thorium and Seaborg uses uranium. And uh, lately they have they have actually done up some some big deals like uh, Copenhagen Atomics. They had the four gigawatts in I think it's four gigawatts in Indonesia, and Seaborg has partnered with uh, uh, KHNP Korean Hydro Nuclear Power and uh, also Samsung uh, Heavy Industries. So they're like up with the big big boys up in the up in the ranks. But uh, other than that, we are seeing that the actually the first ESG uh, compliant investment was uh, into nuclear power after uh, nuclear being adopted in the uh, EU taxonomy officially 1st of January 2023 it was done by a Danish climate fund called Climentum Capital and they were actually investing in the company that I'm a, not a working in but in the same company group called Canful so we had a Danish green energy fund investing 2 million uh, euros in in Canful in Sweden and that's the first time a ESG uh, Article 9 uh, fund has invested in nuclear power in this regard, as, as we know. I haven't heard of any other, uh, uh, ex- uh, any other uh, companies doing this or funds. And also we have the, the third largest fund in the world called Novo Nordisk Foundation. It's the uh, foundation of the, the uh, diabetes company called Novo Nordisk, making all the insulin for, for, for the obese Americans. Uh, not to... Uh, sorry, but uh, it's not going great. Um, and... Uh, their fund, they have uh, invested, I think it's around 20, 20 million um, uh, euros into education and science exploration concerning nuclear in Denmark. So we see uh, private funds doing investment in private companies. We see also private funds doing more like broad uh, educational orientated uh, investments. And then we also see, um, we also see different businesses now saying, I could see an SMR in my backyard or politicians in their local municipality saying, why shouldn't we have a SMR in our backyard? And and not the and they're not talking about mainly about the fourth gen. They're talking about GE Hitachi, BWRX, uh, New Scale. They're talking about APR 300, the, the Rolls-Royce SMR. So they're talking about light water reactors, uh, SMRs, uh, and, and having interest in them. Um, and also with the public, as I said, it, it's 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 we have m- m- many more uh, pro nuclear uh, advocate not advocates, but in the population than than anti nuclear. Forty nine percent of the population are pro nuclear, and thirty two percent are anti nuclear, and the last uh, nineteen to twenty percent are in the I don't know category. So so the 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 the, the, pub, the public has started. So it's it's from bottom up, like in Denmark. Mostly, most of the 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 things happening in Denmark comes from come from the people and goes up to the top. And we see that the public is now pro nuclear. The the funds that actually fund like like gives money to education in Denmark and private companies are going nuclear. And then we see companies being interested in going nuclear. And this is this is a big shift in uh, yeah a couple of years in Denmark. And if we also look at Norway, they are actually a little bit ahead of us in Denmark because they have actually made their own company. Uh, it's called Norsk Kjernekraft. Some uh, activists and some uh, billionaires has, has come together and some PhDs in physics, Suni Varose, a lot of your listeners have maybe heard about her. They have made a company where they will now do feasibility studies and make uh, memorandums of understanding with, with companies like Rolls-Royce and G Hitachi do feasibility studies in municipalities in Norway, where there is an actually need for a lot of power, like tens of gigawatts in need. So they're doing a lot. They're doing a lot of investments there. Also in Sweden, of course, they have nuclear, but but it's being revived now. You have the Canful, the company group that I'm working in, doing a, a lot of SMR projects and and doing feasibility studies and and actually. Uh, being a big part of the utilization of new Nordic nuclear in in these countries, so Denmark is the country that is farthest behind. We also the the most anti country, but we are getting we're getting up to speed in some kind of sense. And I think the most the most uh, exciting thing that is happening right now is that in September we are having a so called parliamentary hearing in uh, the parliament of Denmark Christian Sport. Which where the politicians will invite different organizations, professors, and and so on to 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 talk of, of the case of nuclear, like the hearing that you had in the C- Canadian Parliament. Uh, I think it's two years ago you had it, the 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 famous speech 
And, and that is the same thing that we are doing now, is that we are actually uh, going into parliament, talking to the politicians, being respected and actually being used as a source of information instead of just being activists that are shouting uh, nuclear yes, please. So um, there's a lot of momentum. And, and the, the really, really important thing is that Denmark, that's the last bastion. It's the, if Denmark falls, then everyone can fall. Like, if we go nuclear, the wind pioneering country, the country where we have so much wind that we don't need anything else than windmills, if we remove the laws and we actually go into nuclear, as we're seeing now, that would show that this 100% renewable dream that we're selling, this pinnacle of the global green leader that we are, that cannot even function in our own country. So if it cannot function here, it cannot function, it can function nowhere. And and it's not for me saying that windmills should be abandoned. It's having a more holistic approach and putting all energy sources in. And and also we haven't talked so much about it, but we touched upon it in the start, like with biomass in Denmark. And that that is the green lie in Denmark. If, if we're going to talk about a, a, a green lie, it's not the windmills. It's the biomass. It's the, the, it's the, it's the replace a replacement of coal after the Kyoto Protocol in the 90s to biomass, that is the green lie. That is the the climate catastrophe that we are selling to other countries. We are selling windmills and solar panels, and look at us, we can do it. But the one that thing that we don't mention is that you also have to burn insanely amounts of acres of land to actually make this function. And and that is the green, uh, the green lie, if you should call that, of Denmark. Um, because the countries that actually decarbonize, that is, of course, France, Sweden, Switzerland, Ontario, the province of Ontario, countries where they deployed nuclear power. And, of course, hydro, but you cannot have that in Denmark because we're flat as a pancake. Uh, 100 meters is the tallest. It strikes me that the opportunities for district heating in particular are massive. I mean, I, I, I wish we had those kind of networks set up here, but everyone has their own boiler uh, in their house or their own forced air system. Uh, very little of that. I guess there's some condos and things like that. Um, but that seems like an extraordinary advantage if you're serious about decarbonization um, and a great drop in for thermal from from nuclear. Um, is that something that's being looked at in terms of feasibility studies? I, I, I think the Chinese are the farthest along, although actually no, already in Eastern Europe, there's a number of nuclear plants that are already being used uh, for district heating. Maybe just, you know, in our last couple of minutes, uh, I'm, I'm interested if that's something that's being actively explored or will be part of the hearings in September, um, kind of feasibility studies around uh, nuclear for district heating. Yeah, like uh, district heating from nuclear has, has, has been a thing for tw- yeah, tens of years. Like in Switzerland, in Russia, in Eastern Europe, in China, you have uh, nuclear power plants that do co- co-generation where they both produce uh, water, district heating and electricity. And we have a legacy in Denmark for being some of the best people to actually utilize cogeneration from thermal power plants because of our dis- district heating network. And in combination with the the the, the uh, Department of Energy report showing that 85% of American uh, coal power plants can be retrofitted into to nuclear reactors, uh, and as well as uh, Rowley Patterson, these uh, studies that he made about Helsinki decarbonization with, with district heating and the company Terraprax is also... Uh, making district heating and and retrofitting coal power plants, there's an immense possibility of actually saying we have these thermal power plants in Denmark all over the country at the coast that supplies a lot of energy through biomass. We can retrofit these plants. We already have the infrastructure that is um, uh, cables, electricity cables and district heating pipes. We have a harbor, a deep deep harbor where we can uh, ship materials in. So we actually have the fundament of doing retrofitting of our biomass plants into SMR reactors, doing district heating and and electricity production. So this is going to be a big uh, topic on the the hearing in September, of course, where we will push the case for for actually doing a co-generation with nuclear power plants because we have this uh, opportunity, because we have this uh, remarkable district heating network in Denmark that shouldn't be wasted. Because the with 100% renewable, as we talked about before, like big heat pumps in district heating, it's fairy tale for Gazi, it's Rube Goldberg. Like we're going to to push more smaller heat pumps out in the countryside and out in the cities, and this will be this will abandon the district heating network, having tons of steel in the in the ground for no reason. So <laughs> having a eco modernist thought, but and is, it wouldn't that be the. What? 
Yeah, wouldn't that be the equivalent of a smart grid? Like, I mean, there's all this idea is that our existing grid is, is inadequate because it's unable to accommodate the, the whims of, of wind and solar. And it seems like such a great parallel that you have, you could abandon this incredible district heating network um, and, and duplicate something um, with, with decentralized heat pumps. Just out of curiosity, has, has one of these scaled up massive heat pumps been been created yet or, or is this theoretical? Yeah. You have some in the tens of megawatts of electricity production, uh, but the big ones of a hundred of megawatts. I don't get me like uh, I, I don't really am certain if it is ha- went into production, but there's a big thermal power plant in in Denmark uh, with with SPR, uh, that is actually going to 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 turn into a, a big heat pump, but that has pr- postponed for a year now, and maybe a year more after that and after that. So so no big thermal unit has been converted into a big industrial heat pump yet. Smaller ones has in the tens of megawatts, but but the, but seeing bigger ones, grid scale uh, ones, haven't seen uh, haven't seen them yet. No. Okay, yo, and we have to leave it somewhere. So I think that's as good a place as any. Um, we meant to talk a bit more about Norway. I think we'll have to have you back for uh, the broader Scandinavian discussion. Uh, but this was a fascinating grounder in a in a very interesting place. It's a small country, but you know, obviously for good reasons, has attracted a lot of interest in terms of the the great energy transition debate. So thank you for your contribution. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some footage uh, in September from uh, from these government hearings. Uh, probably it'll be in Danish, but we'll, we'll get some subtitles on it. No, no, go ahead. You were saying? Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I'll do the, the, the end there. Like I'm actually half Norwegian, so it's perfect like having the Norwegian part of it as well. And I'll just uh, also end out saying a, a big thanks to you, Chris, and also the, the Stand Up for Nuclear Organization, which actually got me started and and put us in this uh, situation. And if I have to make my Robert Bryce plug, it's not substack.robertbryce.com, then uh, I make a lot of tweets uh, on Twitter mainly. We haven't got threats until Europe now. It's uh, Solid solid Nuclear, my ad is. And uh, go follow me there for the Danish perspective and uh, covering the Danish lie of biomass and uh, getting nuclear into, uh, into Denmark. So um, that'll be great. Beautiful. We'll get that in the show notes. Okay, Johanna, a real goodbye now, and I hope to meet you soon. Bye for now. See ya. Bye.